Hello and welcome to my next video on cell membranes. So the roles of membranes, you have two sorts of membranes. You have surface membranes, that's on the outside of the cell, also known as a plasma membrane. And you have that within cells. So for example, you have lysosomes, mitochondria, chloroplasts, they all have a membrane or even two in some cases. So the roles. Surface membranes are used to control um, what is entering and leaving the cell. They are partially permeable. They allow some things to enter and some things to not. They are involved in communication, that's cell signaling, and also in cell recognition. So, for example, your immune system won't destroy your own cells. That's when you can have autoimmune problems is if the cells are not being recognised by the immune system and can be destroyed then. Within the cell, so this is around organelles, this is so compartmentalization occurs. You don't want lysosomes, for example, powerful hydrolytic enzymes which can digest cells just being allowed to have their enzymes float around the cell. You want them contained. It can provide a surface area for reactions, so in chloroplasts you have the internal membrane which will turn into granum which is used for the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. In mitochondria, you also have that for respiration. And also it can be used for vesicles in endo and exocytosis, which we'll come on to later. So, cell membranes can be described as fluid mosaic models. This refers to the model of cell membrane structure. The lipid molecules, which we'll come on to next, give fluidity, and proteins in the membrane give it a mosaic appearance. These molecules can move about. So, you've got two layers of phospholipids which we'll look at in a bit and these can flow over each other but in between you have proteins which are dotted around so the proteins make up the mosaic and the fluidity comes from the cell membranes phospholipids All right cell signaling very quickly All right cell signaling is communication between cells using chemical messages this can be drugs hormones many many different molecules the very basic example, which this can be applied to a lot of different things, you will have a receptor on the cell. This will have a complementary shape to a molecule. For in, in this case, I've said hormone, like insulin. The hormone will bind with the complementary receptor and will cause something to occur inside the cell. So components, as we said, phospholipids. Now you have a row of phospholipids and you'll have another row of phospholipids and they will naturally arrange themselves into a bilayer. This is because the actual structure of a phospholipid is there'll be a organic head. So it'll have a phosphate group and a charge. That's the important thing, particularly it has a charge, which means it's polar. This means that it'll interact with water molecules because water forms hydrogen bonds. And you have the that makes it hydrophilic, it likes water. And you have the hydrophobic tail. This is a hydrocarbon tail made out of just carbon and hydrogen. Now that does not mix water, it's not polar, and but it does go quite well with oils. Now this is partially permeable. This in particular will not let ions, anything charged, anything soluble in water, or any very big molecules through. Cholesterol that's a little bit in between the phospholipid bilayer. Now this is made of a lipid, it's a fat, so it can fit in between the bilayer in the fatty middle. This controls membrane fluidity because it binds to the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids causing them to pack more closely together making it less fluid, more rigid. Proteins you have two main types of proteins, channel proteins and carrier proteins. These are in the cell membrane and you have receptors on the cell membrane. Now, the difference. Channel proteins basically form pores in the membrane, which are often shaped to allow only one type of ion through, in particular ions, as they allow ions through. So they'll be gated, meaning they can be open and closed. So if you're doing A2, for example, you have gated sodium ion channel proteins which are involved in the nervous system. So they allow ions. Carrier proteins, these are shaped for a specific molecule. 
example glucose these are generally for bigger or insoluble molecules so have a complementary shape the molecule will fit in then the carry protein imagine as you can see it's the kind of u-shaped one on the diagram it'll go in and then it'll flip around so it becomes like an n and then the thing will be in the cell there'll also be receptors which in particular are the next bit the glycolipids and the glycoproteins now glyco is means carbohydrate so you have a carbohydrate on a lipid which is the phospholipids and you have a carbohydrate on a protein glycoprotein now this is actually quite badly drawn what i've done glycolipids and glycoproteins can only be on the outside of the cell so there's one pointing out and in that's wrong just to trick you um but um they should always be on the outside of the cell now they act as stabilizers because they can form hydrogen bonds with surrounding water molecules they act as sites where drugs hormones and antibodies can bind so binding sites they act as receptors for cell signaling and also antigens they are involved in the immune system so temperature has a big effect on cell membrane fluidity now at one it's about below zero degrees the phospholipids don't have much energy because remember temperature gives kinetic energy which causes vibrations so the phospholipids don't have much energy so they can't move much they're packed very closely together and the membrane is rigid so you'd expect that to have a very low permeability but below zero water can cause ice crystals to form which may pierce the membrane making it permeable and at a certain low temperature carrier proteins and channel proteins will denature they die so that's what happens at one at two this is we'll call this about the optimum temperature now this is well this isn't a, such an optimum temperature but this is a good temperature to have between about zero and 45 they can't move around and aren't packed as tightly together so the membrane is partially permeable and then at 45 is when the temperature increases the phospholipid bi layer starts to break down and the membrane becomes more permeable water inside the cell expands putting pressure on the membrane channel proteins and carrier proteins denature all this causes more permeability so there are four main types of transport across cell membranes you need to know about that is diffusion osmosis active transport and bulk transport so diffusion Diffusion is the movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration down a concentration gradient. So, think of it, I like to think of it, in terms of temperature. So what you do, let's say you're running a bath and it's quite cold. You add some hot water into it. Now the hot water will spread out because there's an area of high concentration of heat in one end of the bath, an area of cold water, low concentration of heat at the other end and then the heat will spread across and fit until there's an equal quantity everywhere now diffusion is passive it needs no energy it just occurs it will go down the concentration gradient now important thing about diffusion is that molecules move both ways so there could be some moving against the concentration gradient occasionally it happens but the overall net movement will be to the area of low concentration and this will continue until there's an equal number on each side. There are a few things that affect the rate of diffusion. Temperature. Now, as we said, increasing temperature gives more molecules more kinetic energy. So this increases the chance that they'll randomly go through the cell membrane. Concentration gradient. If there is, let's say, 10 molecules on one side, 5 on the other, there'll be a gentle diffusion. If there's a hundred molecules on one side, five on the other, quicker diffusion. Movement. This is also stirring. So stirring a liquid. This is not particularly with cells, just in general. Um, if you stir a liquid or the movement of air currents and gas increases, the movement of molecules will then move more. Surface area. Now, if you've got a membrane which is huge, there is going to be more diffusion, more areas for molecules to diffuse. Because if you've got a cell membrane which has got enough room for one molecule to go through and you have 10 molecules it's going to take a while if you've got enough for 10 and you have 10 molecules you'll go through much quicker and distance if you've got 
you know, a nanometer to go through, that will be obviously quicker than a micrometer. Just that. Now, you also have facilitated diffusion. This is when it involves channel proteins and carrier proteins. Still no energy, but it is when if you have, let's say, a lot of glucose on one side, not much on the other, it will diffuse using these carrier proteins or channel proteins if it was ions. Osmosis. Now, water will diffuse, but we don't have the same definitions. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential down its water potential gradient. Water potential is just a measure of how much water there is. It is negative. So if you had 1 million percent, which you can't have, but 100 percent, pure water, that is a water potential of zero. And every time you add non-water stuff into it, so glucose, ions, you reduce the water potential, it goes negative. And water potential has that little trident symbol, psi. Now, it's also measured in kilopascals, that's kPa. And what you have is you have a low water potential when you have a large amount of solute dissolved. Solute is just a substance that dissolves in a liquid. So it has to dissolve. If it is, for example... A red blood cell or carbon dioxide that's something that can't dissolve in water that won't affect the water potential but if it's something like sodium or chloride ions they can be dissolved and they will change the water potential now three types of solutions here you have hypotonic isotonic and hypertonic now hypotonic is when this surrounding solution has a higher water potential so that's near zero than the inside of the cell this means that water will diffuse into the cell isotonic is when the water potential inside and outside of the cell is equal hypertonic is when the water potential inside the cell is lower than outside the cell causing water to diffuse out now the first row is animal cells bottom row is plant cells hypotonic now water will go in and eventually cause the cell to burst. This is called lysis. Isotonic, just water goes in and out. Hypertonic, water will diffuse out and the cell will shrivel. Now, in for plants, hypotonic, water floods in, but it's got a cell wall. So the, cell, the cytoplasm will push against the cell wall, but it will not burst, it will just become turgid. So swollen. Isotonic is the same as for the animal cell, pretty much stays the same. And then hypertonic, now this causes a flaccid cell. Come So yet again, the cell wall will not change because that is strong. But what will happen is that the cytoplasm will move away from the cell wall and cell membrane. This is called plasmolysis. Active transport. Now, this is against a concentration gradient. So this is going from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Now, you have active transport. That means it is active. It requires ATP, which is energy. And then these will always use carrier and channel proteins. Now, one thing with active transport is that if it goes out of goes out of the cell, let's say, into an area of high concentration, they would rarely do that, would rather go into the cell to an area of high concentration. So let's say, actually, for a root cell, it's sucking in minerals, but it'll have a high concentration of minerals inside the cell, but it still wants to get more in. So what will happen is, it will actually transport some ions in, but they will want to go out again, because they will diffuse out into the area of low concentration. Now we need to prevent this. And this occurs because when active transport occurs, the shape of the protein changes slightly. So it becomes non complementary to the molecule, so the molecule can't just go out again. And finally, bulk transport. Four types endocytosis, which is something coming into the cell, exocytosis, going out of the cell, picocytosis, sorry, pinocytosis. It's when a liquid is involved and phagocytosis when a solid is involved. Now, with endo and exocytosis, essentially what will happen is if something will fuse to a membrane. So let's say we'll just give endocytosis. 
so a molecule would fuse to the well sorry fuse to the outside of the cell a vesicle will form from the cell membrane it'll bud off and that vesicle will then transport something into the cell exocytosis when something is in a vesicle it fuses with the cell membrane and then releases the thing and that's that so conclusion you have many different components in the cell membrane you have the phospholipid bilayer cholesterol channel and carrier proteins and receptor proteins and glycolipids and glycoproteins the cell membrane has a fluid mosaic model because the phospholipids can move over each other and the proteins are like a mosaic and you have four types of transport diffusion an area of high concentration to low concentration osmosis is diffusion with water active transport is low concentration to high concentration and bulk transport is moving things in and out of the cell so thank you for listening i hope this helped as usual likes comments feedback whatever email me and thank you for watching and goodbye <laughs>